Would you take your Bible and be turning to the Old Testament book of Joshua, the seventh chapter? Joshua chapter 7. Tonight we are continuing a Sunday evening series going through this Old Testament book. I'm presenting this study under the title, Walking in Victory. We've been learning some lessons in triumphant Christian living from the book of Joshua. Tonight our study brings us up to the seventh chapter of Joshua. And for those of us who preach through books of the Bible, expository preachers, very often something will happen, and that is we will, in a book series or a book study, we will run back into portions of Scripture, sermons that we have visited in times past. Years ago, preaching from the seventh chapter of Joshua, I spoke about the issue of seeing sin in the camp. You may remember that day we talked about Achan taken, Achan shaken, and Achan bacon. Our dear friend, Brother Chris Crawford, who is pastoring in Waycross, who was ordained by this church, preaches a message from this chapter. And he says that Achan took, Achan shook, and Achan cooked. Tonight I want to speak to you from Joshua chapter 7, a message that I originally preached a few years ago. And I want to talk to you tonight from the heart of a pastor about the deadly danger of one man's sin. Would you stand with your Bible open to honor the reading of the Word of God? We're going to read and study all of Joshua chapter 7, but as a place of beginning, let's read the final verse of chapter 6. This is immediately following the victory in the battle of Jericho. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 27, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need go up to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men from the people went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. So the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, both he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan, only to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say, since Israel has turned their back before their enemies for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and they will surround us and cut off our name from the earth and what will you do for your great name so the Lord said to Joshua rise up why is it that you have fallen on your face Israel has sinned They have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them and they have even taken some of the things under the ban and have both stolen and deceived moreover. They have also put them among their own things. Therefore the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Rise up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel has said, there are things under the ban in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things under the ban from your midst. In the morning, then you shall come near by tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes by lot shall come near by families. And the family which the Lord shall take... Come near by household, and the household which the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And it shall be that the one who is taken with the things under the ban shall be burned with fire, he and all that belongs to him. 
because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has committed a disgraceful thing in Israel. So Joshua arose early in the morning and brought Israel near by tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah near and took the family of the Zarahites. And he brought the family of the Zarahites near man by man. And Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household near man by man. And Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and I took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath it. They took them from inside the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the sons of Israel. And they poured them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerai, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him. And brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. May God bless the reading of his word as we bow in prayer for a moment. Father, thank you for the public declaration of Scripture. As we have just read in public hearing, one of the most sobering, one of the most severe, one of the most staggering chapters from your perfect word. May every man, woman, teenager, boy and girl be captivated by the power of the Holy Ghost to listen to this familiar story As if hearing it for the very first time. May each of us tonight be led by the Holy Ghost. To deal with the issues of unconfessed, unrepented of sin in our life. Lest we bring devastation, heartache and deadly danger. Into our own life and the lives of those that we love. Write the truths of this passage on our hearts. For our good and the glory of Jesus, in whose name I pray, amen. In October of 1994, a 57-year-old veteran pilot was flying with his son in their private Cessna aircraft. Not long after taking off from California on their voyage home back to St. Louis, they were coming over the snow-capped mountains, the rocky mountains of the state of Utah. It's at that time Walter Ashcraft radioed to air traffic control and sought permission to begin making an emergency landing. He reported that there was engine failure caused by a sudden loss of oil pressure. Walter Ashcraft began his descent and tried making an emergency landing at a small airport in the snow-capped, fog-covered mountains of Utah. Not long after that radio message, rescuers were called to the crash scene. Walter Ashcraft, his 25-year-old son, and their Cessna airplane crashed into the side of a mountain in Cherry Peak, Utah. The investigation would later determine that a single factor was the ultimate cause of this terrible tragedy. Understandably, Walter Ashcraft, though a veteran private pilot, was distracted by engine failure, blinded by fog and the snow that capped that mountain. The engine failure that had caused this tragic set of circumstances 
The engine failure was caused by a lack of oil. The lack of oil was caused by a disconnected oil supply line. The disconnected oil supply line was caused because of a loose nut. The loose nut in flight vibrated off, spilling precious engine oil inside that engine compartment. And a wealthy and skilled surgeon who had spent his entire life training to save the lives of other people. A 25-year-old man with his entire life out in front of him and a private Cessna airplane that according to the internet just this afternoon would still sell for around $250,000 all came to a fiery and tragic end because of a small piece of equipment about the size of and the price of a dime. The Old Testament figure named Achan if he were alive to speak to us today, would say that story is my story. In the seventh chapter of the book of Joshua, we read of his infamous sin. And it seems to be a small thing, and yet it devastated the people of God. It disgraced his legacy and absolutely destroyed his family. Not because of a ten cent loose nut. But because of one man's sin. And tonight the seventh chapter of Joshua wishes to almost rise up off the pages of God's sacred book. And remind us with a sober warning that God takes the lives that we live very, very seriously. Even if it's one man, one woman, one teenager, one little boy or one little girl's sin. Now from this seventh chapter, there are three simple principles that we need to see. First of all, notice with me in verses 1 through 5, the sinful deed. You know the story, Israel has won the battle at Jericho. And just before going across the rubble of the Jericho walls, Joshua had given them a warning. We saw it in our last installment back in chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. Joshua said, when you go into the city of Jericho, pay very close attention. Joshua warned them, stay away from the things under the ban. Stay away from all the valuable possessions. I know you, he said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to see those things. You're going to desire those things. You're going to take those things. And you will bring a curse upon yourself and a curse upon the entire nation. And it seems as if nearly everyone in the nation paid attention to Joshua's sober warning but there was this one man who thought perhaps he was above it all the laws of God and the commands of the man of God apparently did not apply to him and as they captured the city of Jericho Achan saw some of the gold and the silver he saw a costly garment and he took it the balance of this chapter reminds us that after he took it, he couldn't even enjoy it. By the way, that's what deception and sin always leads to. It's amazing. He, he violated the laws of God to steal something and then couldn't even enjoy using it. He couldn't even enjoy the relationship with those things because he had to do it in a clandestine way. That thing that ultimately cost him his life, his family, his reputation, his testimony was buried in the dirt underneath the tent. As we examine the sinful deed, I want to say a word first of all about the sinfulness of his sin. That might sound redundant to our cultured, sanctified ears, but it's only because we do not fully see the sinfulness of our sin. It's just a small thing to most of our understanding. But yet in verse 1, depending on your Bible translation, God says that what Achan did was unfaithfulness. God says in verse 11 that it was a sin, it was a transgression, it was thievery and deception. And in verse 15, God said that Achan had done a disgraceful thing. This sin 
is a problem not because of how big it is to our human understanding, not because of how small we think it is. This thing is sinful not because of its size, but because of its very nature. The problem is not whether it was a big sin or a little sin, as we tend to categorize these things. The problem is what it was and where it was. A small sin can be the manifestation of a big heart problem. Just like a small growth on the surface of your skin can be the symptom of a major, even fatal medical condition. A tiny clot of blood can lead to a stroke. A tiny piece of plaque can lead to cardiac arrest. A tiny little tumor can shut down the entire human body. A tiny clump of dirt can stop a massive engine. A tiny hairline crack can bring down a jumbo jet. The problem, friend, with each of these things is not just what it is, but where it is. And Aiken's story reminds us tonight that any sin unconfessed, unrepented of, undealt with, any sin that is nestled away in the human heart, unseen perhaps by the human eye, unknown by the other people in our Sunday school class, unknown perhaps even to the other people who live under the same roof we live under, is still seen by a holy, all-knowing God, and it is a very big deal the sinfulness of his sin I want to say a word also about the setting of his sin the context of this sin is very very instructive it was for example a time of great blessing God had just in recent days stalled up the headwaters of the Jordan River and Israel had crossed on dry ground Just a few days earlier, Israel had embarked on this week-long journey marching around the walls of the city of Jericho. And with the blast of a trumpet and the shout of God's people, the mighty, powerful, omnipotent hand of God himself had knocked over the walls of Jericho. And in that context of blessing, this man dared to sin against God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible references the blessings of God that had been performed in the sight of the nation of Israel. And it is in part because of their great blessings that God took their forgetful attitude so very seriously. It's it's because God had done so very much for them that He took their sin so seriously. A couple of years ago, I took one of my children on a father-child trip. And on the course of that trip, we went to some theme parks. We went to some places, you know, where they have the $17.50 Coca-Colas. I spent a lot of money over the course of that week. And on the way home, we stopped at a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant. And my child stomped their foot. And gave me a little attitude over a five dollar bill. And I opened my mouth and my daddy fell out. (laughs) You have any idea how much money I've spent on you this last week? Why it was two hundred dollars to go to the water park. It was two hundred dollars to go here. It's two hundred dollars to go anywhere with a kid these days. I've spent the better part of a thousand dollars counting hotel and all of the other expenses and all of the meals and you're going, get in the car. Do you understand this simple little illustration that it's the amount of money that I had spent that made that little stomp foot and that jutted jaw and that attitude so absolutely unacceptable to me? Do you understand what I'm saying? And here in the sight of a holy God that has poured out blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. Achan would thumb his nose in the face of a holy God. God says, I'm going to deal with that. 
And yet I see so many of God's people, and I'm not exempt or immune from this attitude myself. God pours out blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing, and we will very frequently use those very blessings as a reason to get out from under His Lordship. I could stop there and preach for a while, but I'm going to move on. It was a setting of blessing. But I warned you in our last installment, it was also a setting of boasting. Joshua warned the people, when you go in, stay away from the accursed stuff. Don't you get too big for your britches. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 puts the warning like this. Let a man who thinks he stand Take heed lest he fall. You listen to me, sir. You listen to me, ma'am. There's not a person in this building from the pastor in the pulpit to the first time visitor tonight that is so close to God that you can grow careless and casual and lukewarm and lethargic in your relationship with God. If you think that I'm living so close and I'm living so clean, I sing in the choir, I teach in the Sunday school, I work in the nursery, I'm a deacon, I'm a staff member, I'm a pastor, I don't have to worry about the things of God. You have just set yourself up to go down like a rock. It is in the context of blessing And boasting that Joshua warns the people it can be a dangerous thing to walk in victory. In light of that, maybe the most dangerous person in the building tonight is the one whose life is going well. Business is going great. Things at your house are like the Garden of Eden back before the fall into sin. The sinfulness of this sin. The setting of his sin. Then in verses 4 and 5, the scourge from his sin. 3,000 men go up against the little ragtag town of Ai. They get their hat handed to them. 36 of them get their death certificate handed to them. And Israel flees, tucks tail and runs in the presence of Of their enemy. The entire nation. Goes down in defeat. Listen friend. Listen listen to me. Because of something. One person. Did. Do we not have plenty of examples. Of this principle. Borrowed from other areas of life. One lineman jumps. Ahead of the snap. The entire team goes back five yards. One safety makes an illegal tackle. And it doesn't matter what the rest of the team did. The entire team is penalized. Go over to Walmart. Let your right hand, even just two of your fingers on your right hand, reach over and grab something and put it in your pocket and try to walk out the door without paying for it. And even though your thumb and index finger were the guilty party, they're going to put your whole body in jail. Everyone suffered because of the sin of this one person. I don't stand here tonight to complain, but I can tell you as the pastor and shepherd of this congregation, sin in the lives of individual church members impacts the whole congregation. I believe I'll say that again. Sin in the individual lives of individual church members affects and impacts the entire congregation. It impacts the church in a variety of ways. Even if we set aside the spiritual ramifications for just a moment, it takes valuable time away from the pastor and the staff and the deacon and the Sunday school teacher that can't prepare themselves to teach the Word of God and lead the people of God because they've got to be going around cleaning up the messes made by people who have allowed their lives to fall off into sin. 
What Achan did was an affront against God. May I remind you the gold and silver that he stole was to be used in the treasury of God. He stole, as it were, from God himself. His thievery disobeyed God, displeased God, and defamed God. And cost everybody in his family their very lives. As we consider this sinful deed tonight, I want you to listen very attentively. There are things that I can do that would devastate this congregation. There are things that I could do that would disgrace my wife and my children. And though they didn't do one thing wrong, I could do some things that would make my wife say, we've got to move. I can't even hold my head up down at the walls, IGA. I don't even feel I can go inside over at Walmart. Everyone knows what I have done. But friend, that's not true in my life because I'm a pastor. It's true because I profess Jesus. And what's true for me is true for you as well. One man did this thing, but God says in verse 1, twice God says the sons of Israel did it. Fourteen times in this passage, most of them in verses 11 and 12, God says they did it, they did it, Israel did it. They're being punished, they're being penalized because of what they did. What one man did. God is holding the entire lot accountable. I've pastored and I've preached and I've counseled and I've lived long enough to know that the effectiveness of our corporate worship services is very frequently determined before church even starts. What happens on Wednesday nights, Brother Scotty, is very frequent. Whether or not God saves some lost people and convicts some backslidden people. Whether or not you have a freedom to preach. Whether or not there's a freedom in worship. Very often all of that is determined before we welcome the first person. Because young people, it doesn't have anything to do with what happens on the stage over at the warehouse. It has to do with what happened in the locker room on Tuesday, in your own bedroom on Monday night, mom and dad. It happens because God is not pleased with undealt with sin in the lives of his people. The sinful deed. Now in verses 6 through 19, let's examine the shocking discovery Nobody had any idea what had happened. Nobody except the guilty party and God. But before the chapter comes to a close, everybody in all of Israel knows about it. As we examine this shocking discovery, notice in verses 6 through 9 the agony of Joshua. Joshua, along with all of the elders of Israel, in our context, the pastor, the staff, the deacons, call an emergency meeting. Joshua falls on his face before God. They put dust upon their heads. That was an ancient custom symbolizing their brokenness in the sight of God. And Joshua begins to pour out his heart to the Lord. And we could boil his prayer-filled, penitent question down to one little word. Why? We just defeated the, the, the most fortified city in the ancient world. And we went up against the army of Podunk and we were defeated. Not only were we defeated, we were defeated in disgrace. I mean, we didn't just lose. We got pulverized by this little ragtag army. Why, God? Why? Perhaps it is a blight against many of our churches that most business meetings don't start like that. You ever been to a Baptist church business meeting where it started like this? Why, God? Why? The pastor has preached the gospel, but nobody got saved. Why, God? Why? Lord, this.
this is down and this is down and, and, and it doesn't seem that you're moving. Why, God? Why? Why? Joshua falls on his face before God in brokenness and contrition and in agony. He wants to know why they lost the battle of Ai. After the agony of Joshua, verses 10 through 15, there's the answer from Jehovah. God began to answer. And the answer that he gives in verse 10 is staggering. So the Lord said to Joshua, rise up. Why is it you have fallen on your face? Look right up here and listen to your preacher tonight. Joshua is on his face before God. Dust upon his head, begging God to answer his question. And essentially, the first thing that God says is, Get up and quit praying. We don't think like that, do we? God says, Joshua, all your praying is going to do no good until you deal with. With the issue of sin. You can hush up your prayer. You can get off your face. All that religious activity will do no good. Until you deal with this simple fact. Israel has sinned. Somebody took some of the accursed stuff from under the ban back at the city of Jericho. And they have intermingled it along with all of their possessions. And then God makes, listen to me friend, God makes one of the most sober statements that I find anywhere in the Bible. You find it here in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 12. He says that if you don't deal with this sin, are you listening to me? If you do not deal with this sin, I am not Going with you. Chapter 6 closed after the battle of Jericho. With Joshua's fame spreading all throughout the region. And the Bible says that the Lord was with Joshua. But now God is saying, Joshua, listen to me friend. You've got a choice. It's the sin or it's me. It can't be both, but it must be one or the other. You've got to make a choice. Deal with the sin in your midst or you'll spend the rest of your life without knowing my hand of blessing. What's the answer from Jehovah? Somebody has sinned. Somebody stole some stuff at Jericho. He said, Joshua, here's what I want you to do. I want you to announce to the people, ahem, I've been with God. God told me why we lost the battle at Ai. Somebody here stole some stuff from Jericho. God said for me to tell you to go home, get a bath, get a good night's sleep. I want all of you to report back in the morning. God has already revealed to me that tomorrow morning when we gather together, He's going to reveal through me who the guilty party is. You're dismissed. After we have this agony of Joshua and the answer from Jehovah, there's the assembly at Jericho. And camp just outside the city walls of Jericho, in the tattered ruins of the defeat at the city of Ai, Israel gathers together to hear from God. And in this particular time in human history, God revealed His will in a number of ways. In this case, He did it with the casting of lots. And if you go back and follow the the family line, the, the genealogy, you'll find that all of Israel is assembled in front of Brother Joshua. 
And the Holy Spirit through the casting of lots reveals that the guilty man is in the tribe of Judah. Can you imagine what happens when the tribe of Judah is taken? By the way, just as there were 12 tribes of Judah, there are 12 sections of pews here in this sanctuary. Six on the floor and six in the balcony. Imagine that I said the guilty party is in this section right here. Everyone else is dismissed in the balcony and everyone else in any other section. Just this group right here. You stay at attention. The rest of you go get some torches and go get some rocks. We're going to deal with the matter. And after the family and the tribe of great-great-granddaddy Judah was taken, they began to narrow it down and went away the crowd. The Bible says, beginning in verse 16 and following, they take the great-great-granddaddy's tribe and then great-granddaddy's family and then granddaddy's family and all the way down to daddy's family until verse 18. He brought Zabdi's household near, man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, was taken. What would happen if we were in this building tonight and God were to say, the problem that I have with Emmanuel Baptist Church is not a corporate problem as much as an individual problem. And what if the Holy Spirit started singling out your section, your pew, your family, you? The shocking discovery. You know, a moment ago I shared with you that there were things that I could do as a pastor that would disgrace this church. Some things I could do as a pastor in a small town like Blackshear, this church might never recover from it. You find out I've been messing with kids in the nursery, this church won't live long enough to recover from all of the fallout and the tragedy that I could bring into the life of this church. Are you listening to anything I'm saying? But as tragic as that would be, that's not why Israel lost at the battle of Ai. Israel did not lose at the battle of Ai because the Aiites didn't appreciate or respect Israel. Israel lost the battle of Ai even though nobody knew anything about it because God was not with them. sinful deed, the shocking discovery. Beginning in verse 20 through the end of the chapter, we notice thirdly, the sovereign discipline. The scripture says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. God in his holiness must deal with this sin. and He's about to deal with it. In verses 20 and 21, let's read it and notice the futility of his statement. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. And then in verse 21, he simply confesses it. Now in my outline tonight, I have called this the futility of his statement. Why is that? Listen, friend. He had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent and he never repented. He never confessed what he had done until he had been caught as it were red handed. He's a classic biblical example of someone that is not sorry for what they have done. They're only sorry that they got 
What if we could go back to the day before when Joshua says, Listen up Israel, I've been with God. God has revealed why we lost the battle of Ai. What would have happened if Achan would have said, It was me, it was me, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have done it, I shouldn't have taken it. It was me, oh God, forgive me. But he sat there with his lips locked tight. Throughout all the process of family consecration during the night, he said nothing. The tribe of Judah is taken. And in my mind, I see Achan staring and looking around as if he's going to throw off God himself. Who, who, wonder who it could be. Generation after generation just winnows away the whole nation down to the guilty man. And it's only then that Achan confesses. In Hebrews chapter 3, listen to this sobering warning. The Bible says that you and I should repent while today is still called today. Lest our hearts become hardened. By the deceitfulness of sin. If you and I are living in sin, we ought to repent today in part because that's what God commands us to do. But I've lived long enough, I hate to tell you, but I've experienced what I'm about to tell you in my own life. There's another reason that you ought to repent today because you might wake up tomorrow and not be as sorry as you ought to be. You might find that the passing of time and the clicking off of days makes you less and less sorry for what you have done. And so the writer of Hebrews says, Repent while today is still called today. Don't wait till tomorrow because you might wake up tomorrow with a heart that has been hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. A seminary professor used to challenge his class on the subject of repentance. And he told them, there's really no need to repent till the last day of your life. Just wait to repent, kind of take, take care of all of it at one time. No need to repent until the last day of your life. And in every class, somebody would raise their hand and say, yeah, but we don't know when the last day of our life is going to be. And the professor said, that's exactly right. That's why you better repent today. The futility of his statement. In verse 22 and 23, we read about the publicity of his sin. So Joshua sent messengers. They ran to the tent. and Behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath it. They took it from inside the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the sons of Israel and poured them out before the Lord. Several years ago, Andrea and I were attending a Bible conference. While we were there in the hotel, I, I, this, this statement is etched in my mind. I was ironing a shirt, had the news on. And the news report was coming out of the state of Louisiana. David Vitter was one of the two U.S. senators from the state of Louisiana. And he rose to infamy when his name was discovered in the little black book of a lady that they would later called the D.C. Madam. A woman who was running a, a brothel, a prostitution ring, providing these immoral services to well-situated, famous men. David Vitter's name was listed in that little black book. He called a press conference to acknowledge what he had done. He also indicated that his only sins, both against God and his wife, had occurred years earlier. And by God's grace, he had already confessed those sins to his wife. And their marriage was already reconciled. In other words, within the Vitter household, this was already old news. As I ironed my shirt, I said, what a tragedy that it's come out after all this time. And my wife said, it always does. 
It might not even come out in this life. But may I simply remind you, one day your kids are going to go through the stuff in your shop. One day somebody's going to go through the remnants of whatever you've left behind. But even if it's not discovered then, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed. Nothing hidden that will not be made known. Whatever you've said in the darkness will be heard in the light and whatever you've whispered in the inner room shall be proclaimed from the housetop. The fact that many of us, including your pastor, tend to walk through life more concerned with others finding out. More concerned about that possibility than the reality that God already knows about it. Is a staggering indictment. The publicity of his sin, the futility of his statement. and Then there's the severity of his sentence. Verse 24, then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him. And they brought it up to the valley of Achor. That word means the the valley of trouble. And verse 25 says that Israel stoned them with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And verse 26, they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this very day. The laws of God in the book of Deuteronomy prohibited executing children for the sins of their fathers. Listen to that again. The laws of Deuteronomy prohibited the execution of children for the sins of their fathers. This is clear indication that the whole family was complicit in what had happened. Achan is the one that did it. Everybody in the family knew about it. Nobody said a thing. Achan was the spiritual leader of his family. And you say, oh, oh, we sure wish he had led his family. Listen to me. He did. He led his family to drink from the cup of the wrath of God. And he led his family to an untimely death. I know tonight we're in the Old Testament, but may I remind you that in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16, the Bible speaks of a sin unto death. You say, that, can scare, that kind of scares me a little bit, preacher. Sit, sit up straight and still listen to me. It kind of scares me a little bit, preacher. It ought to. God takes sin very seriously. Our sin may be unknown to everyone else, but it is not unnoticed by God. And our sin will impact our family, our lives, and even our church. Walter Ashcraft lost his life. And his son because of a little dime-sized nut. Achan lost his life and his family for a little gold and a little silver. Never let it be said that God had to discipline us, our family or our church, because of one teenager's. One boy's, one girl's, one woman's, one man's sin. Our heads are bowed in prayer.
There is a remedy. The remedy for Achan's is the same remedy for the Rahab's. And that is to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel is this, that where sin did abound, grace can much more abound. That no matter what you have done, who it was with, how long ago it was, God will forgive you. The scripture says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> in 30 seconds, we're standing to our feet to sing. If you need to do business with God, this place of prayer is open. Staff members from this church will be here to receive you if you need somebody to pray with you. Father, would you oversee and superintend this time of commitment? For our good and Christ's glory, I pray. Amen.